Howdy. Howdy. We're from College Station. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk, uh, first of all, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a social worker, and uh, Misty is actually my supervisor. So uh, any good kudos that you can give to her about me would be great. <laughs> yeah, maybe a raise at some point in time. Uh, I work in oncology. Uh, with cancer patients. And uh, I'm going to talk today about the emotional aspects of living with a chronic illness. And some people might think, you know, why was I asked to talk about this? You know, what do I know about, you know, living with someone with chronic illness? I do not have scleroderma. But I know about body malfunction, restrictive pain, debilitating physical changes, deprivation of social functioning, loss of work, careers, social isolation, the threat of that traditional role that we play in, with our friends and in our relationships, loss of identity, dissociative self-image, extinguished hopes, loss of intimacy, fear of progression, feeling alone and powerless, insufficient information about treatment, treatment limitations, seeking reassurance, avoiding the sick row, the denial, protecting of our family, perseverance, and hope. And before I can move forward about what I think about chronic illness and scleroderma particularly, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. At the age of 40, I was diagnosed with uh, stage four breast cancer. And uh, I also had stage three uh, multiple melanoma. And it had metastasized uh, to my lungs. And at the time, I was married, and, and uh, my daughter was only in junior high, and my son was four. And uh, we had him, you know, later in life. And uh, I remember going to the doctor uh, after having all the tests, and I found the lump through my breast, and, and uh, he told me that I had the cancer. The next words out of his mouth was, you know, you need to go home and take care of business. And <coughs> I, I said, you know, what do you mean, take care of business? And he said, well, he said, your prognosis is really poor. And my first question was, so are you saying I'm going to die? And he said, yes. Well, that was in 2002, you know, and here I am. And, uh, and I have learned so much along the way. But um, as a result of the breast cancer, I had to have a mastectomy. And I did not have reconstructive surgery, mainly because of my <coughs> age. And uh, the cancer kept coming back twice until finally, you know, they, they found the right cocktail, so to speak. And I was in treatment pretty much for two years. I had chemotherapy, I had radiation, and then I lost all my hair, I uh, lost my eyebrows, lost my eyelashes, you know, uh, my skin was just an, an awful uh, place. I had lost my fingernails, and everywhere I went, you know, people just stared at me. Because I wasn't one to wear a wig, I, you know, I used to just wear a cap, and, or I just went bald. And, uh, uh, but I went through, and my family went through, a lot of emotions, a lot of I don't know, fears, that I'm sure as a result of having scleroderma or any disease, you know, everybody sitting in here has also experienced that. Not only as an individual having had scleroderma, but also with your family. Well, Fast forward a little bit, uh, I've only been working in the oncology area about seven years now. And uh, it was ironic because when I had the cancer, I was not in oncology. I was working for a hospital as a social worker. And, uh, and, I, and I was not a Christian then either. Uh, today, I, you know, I praise God for, for me because, uh, for my life, because the doctors pretty much said, you know, go home and take care of your business, but, you know, God had other plans for me. And ironically, uh, I went to, just as an interim at the uh, cancer clinic with Misty, the 
social worker there had left, and I was just there as an interim. And after I was there for about two weeks, Misty came to me and asked me if I'd like to stay permanently. And, uh, and I said yes, and then, you know, here we are. When I first met Misty, and little does she know that she's actually going to be my, my object of, of conversation, and she kept asking me, can you tell me what you're going to talk about? And I said, no, I'm not. I'm going to because last night we were in the hotel room, and she practiced hers, and she said, you going to tell me yours? I said, no, I'm not. So, but um, I noticed when I first met Misty, and I don't even think she was aware of it, she would talk just like normal, but then she'd cough. And, uh, and it, this coughing, and in fact, I never had to tell her this, but it was annoying to me. <laughs> because we, she'd be in a conversation, and then she would just cough. And then she'd continue on a conversation, and she'd cough. And I'm thinking, man, what's wrong with this lady? You know, I, I thought, does she have a tick? Does she, you know, does she have a chronic cough? And, and uh, but then after a while, you know, she kept doing it. But then I didn't pay much attention to it, you know, after a while. And, uh, and so, but she shared with me, you know, I'm not feeling too well, BJ, I'm going to go to the doctor. And she shared with me the story about her foot. Didn't think anything of it, you know. I thought, well, it's probably, you know, muscle, she's running muscle because the woman's constantly walking all over the cancer center. And, and so finally she came into my office one day and she closed the door. And, and uh, I, and, and and I am an emotional person. I, I probably will get emotional, but um, from Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, Missy is my supervisor. But after 5 and on weekends, she's my friend. And uh, she sat down and, and she said, well, I know what's wrong with me. And I just dismissed it. I said, oh, it's probably no big deal, right? She said, I have scleroderma. And I said, what in the heck is that? <laughs> I had never even heard the word. And I was kind of surprised because having been in the social worker in the medical field for 20 plus years, you know, I just never heard of it. And, uh, and, and she, she told me, you know, what it was and, uh, and then how it, you know, it attacked her organs at the lungs. And, uh, and I said, okay, I said, so what do we do now? You know, what, what do you got to do? You got to just take a few pills, medicines, and, and then it'll go away. She said, no. She said, it's not going to go away. And uh, she didn't cry, I remember. And I did, of course, you know, after she left, because that's just in my DNA. And, uh, and I, I just stopped right then and prayed. You know, I, I, I prayed, <coughs> for, you know, use me, God, you know, how, how can I help her? And so, Misty never did really talk much about it. And I could understand. I mean, we were in a work setting. You know, uh, she was my supervisor. Everybody at the clinic loves her. And uh, she pretty much, I, but in, in this journey that, that she's done from beginning to now, and I, I can see in the future, I have noticed the changes and the emotional aspects of what scleroderma has done to her and to her family. And I actually uh, started keeping a journal about Misty. And I have the date when she initially told me when she was diagnosed because I wanted to observe her. Uh, but I didn't tell her that I was because uh, I wanted her to be herself and, and I wanted to see the truth aspects of what this chronic illness, you know, does. Was it similar to me? You know, I remember feeling all these things. You know, the body images, uh, you know, lose the loss of the hair, the loss of my breath, my breast. And, and you know, for women, that's a big deal. You know, and, and uh, we can hide our breasts and other parts, but we can't hide unless we wear a wig. And, and uh, she talked about the possibility of losing her hair. She taught me about, you know, the skin changes that she's going to be experiencing. But the main thing I wanted to, to, to key on was the emotional stuff. And we, we've grown close in our relationship to where she knows 
she comes into my office and she closes the door and I know that's the easy time. And uh, she has shared with me the anger that she has felt. The anger that her husband Eric has felt. And there were times when uh, Eric didn't know what to do for her. You know, do I hold you or do I, let, do I leave you over here for a little bit? Do I go with you? Do I not go with you? You know, the denial as a spouse of a person with a disease. You know, what is their role? You know, your mothers, your sisters, your brothers, your children. You know, they don't know. They, they don't know what to do. And sometimes when we don't know what to do, we do nothing. And, but then when we tend to do nothing, then I think that's when we start shutting down more and more because we just get accustomed to that. And then we think, well, the person with the disease is going to tell us what we need to do because we certainly don't know what to do. But then that person doesn't know what to do either. And, and so there has to be a balance somehow between us. And I think as people, we don't, we're not very good creatures to tell other people what we need. You know, we either assume that people should know what we need by, by our behaviors or we just assume, you know, it's like telling, uh, you know, somebody, you know, I love you and you think you assume that because you're married. But we need to hear those things. And, uh, and, and then I could see that she was emotionally shutting down. You know, she wasn't letting any of us in. She, she'd walk by and her head be down because to get to her office, she has to go by my office. And, uh, but I always kind of knew when to go to her and when to, to leave her alone. And, uh, cause she knew me well enough to say, you know, BJ, you, you need to back off a little bit, you know, cause she's never luckily told me that. <laughs> but I saw her emotionally shutting down and there were different things that she was doing. You know, she's very, very involved in her work. She's passionate about her work. And she was always on top of each and every one of us. There's about 16 or 17 of us that she supervises. But I noticed that she was kind of pulling back a little bit, you know, from all of us, spending a little bit more time in her office and, and uh, you know, not talking to us as much. And, and, uh, but yet she would still come in and she'd share about how she felt. And she wasn't telling anybody other than just a select few of us that she had scleroderma. And she, at that point in time, she hadn't even told Danielle, who, you know, he's her daughter. And, uh, and she's lost weight, she's gained weight. Lost weight, she's gained weight. And uh, I could see that her self-image about herself wasn't, wasn't very healthy, wasn't very good. And, uh, but she'd always tell me when she'd go to the doctor and we'd say a little prayer together and, and uh, always let her know I'd always be there with her whether I could go with her or not. And, but she usually always had her mom, he's just very supportive, her husband is very supportive that would go with her, and the friends that she would ask to go with her. And she finally <coughs> came to a place where, and I think that's what she was saying, that she just finally gave into the fact that this disease is not gonna go away. And like my cancer, even though I've been cancer free, you still have consequences of having had cancer. Uh, you know, I have lymphedema in my left arm. I've had to have two shoulder replacement surgery. I can't raise this arm. And, and I get so upset when I can't reach something on a shelf at a grocery store, you know, or, uh, you know, I can't, that's why I had to cut my hair, because I couldn't do my hair. Mm -hmm. And there's just certain things that I've had to learn that I can't do. And I get so angry because I'm so used to doing those things myself. And then she started talking about things that she's noticed changes with. And that's when I, you know, realized, you know, as having cancer, but not having scleroderma or any disease, the, the, the feelings and the emotions that we share are so identical. And I think that's why we were able to relate so well. And unless you walk that walk, you, you really can't tell someone how it feels. 
to have this disease, whether it's scleroderma or anything else. And sometimes people don't know what to say when you tell them. Or then you may be sitting in a restaurant or in a movie or something like that, and you look around, and someone's just staring at you. You know, and and some people, when they get stared at like that, they're, you know, they either sit up and say, okay, now you can stare at me more, or they speech down and they feel embarrassed and uh, they can understand. But I think with time and acceptance, you start feeling more confident in yourself because one thing I've learned is that, you know, how God created us in his image. And it's not what we have on the outside that matters. What matters is what's our soul and our heart and, and the fact that we can accept and love one another exactly where we are. And so I saw where Misty then all of a sudden started, you know, walking with a little head up higher. She started telling everybody. Uh, I've, I've been with her and I was shocked one day. We were talking to some people and she goes, I have scleroderma. <laughs> and I looked at her and I thought, wow. <laughs> you know, because that had been the first time I had ever heard her say those words out loud to someone else other than the people that she just wanted to share it with. And, uh, and, and, it's, and, and it reminded me, as a counselor years ago, I'd go to, you know, these AA meetings and somebody would stand up and say, oh, hi, I'm BJ and I'm, I'm an alcoholic. And, uh, and she, was, she felt she was so confident when she said those words. So soon after, sometimes she came to me and she said, I want to do a support group. And because Missy's the only person I know with scleroderma. But today, I know more people with scleroderma. And she said, when she was diagnosed with scleroderma, there was only one other person, I believe, that she had met. And I don't think she's as active anymore in it because of her health. And she said, I want to get the word out here in Brazos County. She said, because I know I'm not the only one in Brazos County that has scleroderma. And she said, I want to get the word out there. I want to educate. I want to train. And because you've been through what you've been through, and you're not afraid to talk to anybody. She said, we, I want to do a support group. Will you help me? And I didn't even hesitate. I said, of course. And so her and I, we met with Kathy on the phone. And, and uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to meet with some of the other support group, you know, leaders while I'm here. Uh, I've ran a support group before for breast cancer, but never for scleroderma. But I don't really feel that it's going to be that different, you know, because we all have something in common. And I can relate to the, the emotional aspects of it and the changes that it, that it comes with it. So that's where we're headed. We're headed to, to start. We haven't had a start date yet. We're supposed to be starting at the end of this month. We were going to start in December, but we postponed that with the holidays, you know, and everything. And so, you know, anything that anybody can share with us as to how to get it started, um, in the past, when I've done the breast cancer support groups, it has, I'll be very honest, it hasn't been successful. We would have a few come, and then all of a sudden we never saw them again. And we took a survey as to why people weren't coming, and there were different reasons. There's Facebook now, there's blogs. People don't want to show their emotions in front of other people. You know, they can hide behind the, the phone or computer or on the, you know, and. And we did different times. We brought food. I mean, food brings people. You know, no matter where you go, that is to help. So, you know, I, I, I want this to be successful. And uh, and I know in order to, for it to be successful, we have to reach out you know, to, to people that are pioneers in it. Uh, you know, we're, we're very novice and we're going to be. And uh, But we're willing to take this challenge on and, and, and get the word out there so that we can train more people, so that the people that don't know, like me, at one time about scleroderma will learn about scleroderma, and that you don't feel alone, and uh, feel like you know you're understood, and that your caregivers will understand your husbands, your children, and and, and that to get that education out, so that people aren't afraid to step out 
can say, you know, I have this disease and I need some help, or at least I just need someone to listen to me. <coughs> so thank you for inviting us. I've, I've been <coughs> excited about coming for a long time, and, and I'm so glad to meet some of the people and, and just look forward to a relationship um, so that we can learn more about the disease. Thank you. Thank you.